All right. So we have uh, been studying about John the Immerser. We've gone through the details of his birth in Luke chapter 1. Uh, we've begun part 2. John prepared the way for the Messiah. He taught the people. Uh, we see that he, here in, in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we have details that enable uh, extra historical records to be able to date exactly when this was that John starts in verse 3 uh, to teach uh, in the wilderness. This would have been around 29 AD. Uh, we know that in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, just kind of a random uh, reference that kind of gives us a little bit more detail as, into what all he taught, because we don't have a lot of specifics of his words. We know the general topics that he covered regarding the kingdom of heaven being at hand, uh, regarding what we're going to talk about here in just a minute, the baptism of repentance. Uh, but uh, we also know that he taught his disciples how to pray, and that's mentioned in Luke 11, verse 1 as well. And as we see here in Luke chapter 3, verse 3, he went into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And the last thing we discussed uh, a couple of weeks ago before we uh, had a hiatus here was in Mark chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, we're told that multitudes were coming out to John to be baptized by him, and they were confessing their sins. And it's important to distinguish the difference between Jesus' baptism or the baptism of forgiveness of sins versus the baptism of repentance unto or for the remission of sins. Uh, the fact that the people were going out and they were confessing their sins speaks to what regarding their understanding uh, and being baptized by John. Okay, and that's that was we've talked we talked as we as like I said as, as we were ending last or the last study, we were discussing why John was necessary. Why not just send Jesus, and you know why why bother with needing to send this messenger to prepare the way? And what we discussed was the fact that Israel, by and large, I'm not going to clump every 100 percent of every Jew in there, but by and large, the Jews had been convinced that through the law they had forgiveness of sins. Now, granted, their sins were covered in the sense of the, the, uh, the sacrifices that were offered in the temple, uh, the Day of Atonement. Their sins were covered or, or kind of hidden away, but that does not mean that they were removed. They were remitted. They weren't taken away completely. And so they didn't have a full understanding of that. They thought that they had no need to, to have forgiveness because their sacrifices gave them forgiveness. But the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin, according to the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 10. And so Israel had to be taught, had to be told that you need a savior. Okay? The old law is not enough to save you. You need someone to come in to enable you to have full salvation and forgiveness of sins, something beyond just the blood of bulls and goats. But in order for you to understand the, the need for that savior, you need to understand the fact that you need to be saved to begin with. The law doesn't save you, and as a result, you need to understand you have to repent of your sins and be looking out for the Messiah of promise who will bring about that full, uh, or full remittance of your sins, that full remission uh, that will be available. And so what we find here in verse 3, he's going into the region, he's preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It's not to remove sin. It's repentance unto remission of sins. Because I can't have forgiveness of my sins unless I repent from the sins I've committed. Unless I recognize aspects or, or attributes, characteristics, choices that I make in life, habits, whatever, that I'm doing that is contrary to God's word. I can't have forgiveness of sins until I have determined to put those things away. And, of course, repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry. What is repentance? It's turn, yeah, turning away. In fact, sometimes it's, it's uh, defined. There's, there's a couple different terms for repentance, but, but they all have to do with turning 180 degrees away. Okay, turning, going away from them, recognizing what they are and going away, making a change in my heart. 
Well, you know, we've talked before about how that John says in 1 John chapter 1, that uh, in verse 9, that God is faithful uh, and he, will, he is just to forgive us our sins as we confess our sins to him. Well, what Mark chapter 1 kind of gives us is the understanding that if I confess my sins, that automatically implies that I'm repenting of my sins. I'm not confessing sins, but then thinking to myself that they were perfectly fine to start with. The only reason I'm confessing sins is that I'm recognizing what I've done is wrong. And, and so that's part of what John tells us about receiving forgiveness of sins for after we become Christians, that when we confess our sins to him, that implies a, repent, a penitent heart on my end. He is faithful and just to forgive me of those sins. Anything through uh, Luke chapter 3 and Mark 4 before we move on to Acts 13? Because it's, it's really important, especially as we talk to friends and neighbors about uh, John the Baptist and about the different types of baptisms in the, in the New Testament. You've got you know, baptism of John, the baptism of Jesus, you've got baptism of fire, you've got baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's several different references to quote-unquote baptism or immersion. Uh, and understanding the context of those things. But a lot of people get hung up on the baptism of John. They don't really see the difference between what Jesus brought and what John did. Uh, in Acts chapter 13 and starting in verse 23, this is Paul and Barnabas as they're uh, teaching and preaching. Uh, starting in verse 23, from this man's seed, according to the promise God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus, verse 24, after John had first preached, before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, talking about the Messiah, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to loose. Uh, so it, as Paul's describing kind of the, the, the chronological order in which these things have taken place according to prophecy, he brings up the fact that after John had first preached, okay, now there was some overlap, uh, maybe about a year and a half-ish, maybe even a year, between Jesus and John. Um, but after John had first preached, before Jesus, not before Jesus was born, but before Jesus' uh, ministry started, before his teaching started, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. All right, anything through Acts 13. All right, so Matthew chapter 21, uh, we have Jesus, and of course there's, this provides us, and of course Jesus actually provides quite a bit of confirmation regarding what John accomplished, what he was there to do. But in verse 23, or starting in verse 23 of Matthew 21, Jesus is going to, there's going to be an attempt to challenge him regarding his authority. It says, when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And we've talked about this in other lessons, acknowledging the fact that, that even the Pharisees and the elders of the people understood that in order to teach anything of God, you have to have authority for what you teach. Okay, you have to be coming from a place of having learned these things from you know, the, the, the Old Testament at that time, uh, from God's word, uh, having been taught by someone who was well learned in the law, whatever. There's some authority, some uh, position from which you're able to teach these things. They ask Jesus, by what authority do you do these things or teach these things? And in verse 24, Jesus answered and said to them, I will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? So you notice, first of all, that Jesus brings up John, but he specifically brings up the baptism of John. Okay, so he doesn't just talk about John, he talks about what John was teaching. And even maybe more to the point, the authority with which John was teaching and the baptism of John. Now, even at this point, John's baptism is a very important aspect of what John brought and what he taught in preparing the hearts of Israel to receive the Messiah. Well, everybody was aware of what John was doing. 
Okay, John was not some random kind of fringe individual that only a few people knew about. Multitudes and multitudes of people were going out, hearing him, and being baptized by him. Well, when Jesus asks this question, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Well, they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. And so they responded in verse 27, we don't know. So Jesus says, fine, then I'm not going to tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, the question becomes, well, what did they really believe? And I, I tend to think that they probably didn't really believe he was from men, because notice, we fear the multitude. Uh, so that probably kind of dissuaded them from saying it specifically, but they understood that everybody else believes he was a prophet from God. But if we say that he was from heaven, going along with what the multitudes believed, well, then he's going to turn it around and say, well, why didn't you listen to him? Okay, well, interestingly enough, the fact that John himself pointed out Jesus as being the Lamb of God, as being the one, the anointed one of promise, they would end up, if they did say from heaven, then they would, ipso facto, have to admit and acknowledge that Jesus was the one of promise, that his authority also was from heaven. And that's really ultimately the point. When Jesus, it, it's kind of a, I think, you know, obviously Jesus knew full well they weren't going to answer. But it, it's a rhetorical point to show that if John's, what John taught was from heaven, as the multitudes believed and as in fact it was, Jesus was also, and what Jesus did was from heaven as well. But it's interesting to note, at least as far as we know, as far as recorded, no one challenged John's authority. Everybody acknowledged John, even the Pharisees went out, he, uh, John called him a brood of vipers, but even the Pharisees went out to be baptized of him, uh, kind of for, for looks, I think more for, for appearance's sake, and John called him out on it. But as far as what we have recorded, nobody questioned John's authority to teach the things that he taught. All, the whole multitudes were going out there and acknowledging what he was teaching. So why wasn't Jesus given the same, especially given the miracles that he did? Remember, we taught before uh, in John chapter 10, there seems to be the suggestion that John never even did any miracles. Not that he wasn't full of the Holy Spirit, but that as individuals acknowledge in John 10, starting in verse 40, John did no signs, and yet everything he said about this man was true, or is true. Thoughts or comments through that? All right. So in Acts chapter 19, and in verse 1, starting in verse 1, we have an account of 12 individuals who were baptized of John. And I think this is a very important, has multiple applications, this example does. But even as far into the you know, 50s, 60s, well, about, you know, this would be about the, the 50s AD or so, uh, 54, 55-ish, John's baptism is still widely known, and there are still quite a number of people who haven't heard anything about the Messiah, about Jesus, but they do know of John. And so John's teaching has spread, okay, throughout not just where John was in Judea, but throughout, I mean, at this point, Paul, he's in Ephesus. So, I mean, there's people in Ephesus who had been taught, at least taught, not necessarily maybe personally by John, but at least taught what John taught by maybe other disciples or whatnot. So starting in verse 1, it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? And so they said, Into John's baptism. So they were baptized into John's baptism. You would think that that would probably mean that they were baptized personally by John. However, it's entirely possible that others were going about doing the same thing, teaching the same thing, and saying this is what John the Baptist, John the Immerser taught. But they had been baptized into John's baptism. Now, Paul asks the question about receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, it's 
indeterminate if Paul is specifically speaking about the miraculous gifts aspect of the Holy Spirit or receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is eternal life. Uh, now, here in a little while, after they're baptized, he's going to lay hands on them and they will receive the gifts or the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but when Paul asks this question, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed?" A lot of people take that to mean that when people truly believe, they will receive the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Personally, I tend to think that Paul knew full well these individuals hadn't been baptized into Christ, and he's using this as a means of starting a conversation. Okay, as a means, because they, they respond, we haven't heard about anything about a Holy Spirit. And so this opens that door for him to be able to teach the baptism of Jesus to them. But what's the, the key component here is starting in verse 4. John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. We find out in verse 7, there's 12 of them. What's interesting here is that going through the motion of being immersed was not retroactive to count for the baptism of Jesus. Why not? I mean, they could have easily responded with, we've already been immersed. So, I mean, now we've been, we've been taught about Jesus. So we just kind of retroactively make that effective for this. Why get wet again? Exactly. Yeah, they did not have an understanding of what they were doing. What is a very important application of this for us today? Especially as we talk to friends and neighbors, people who are religious. Huh? Resurrection. That, that's true. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So the power of baptism didn't have any power to, to save anyway. But even, let's say even if, as there's some commentators that suggest these individuals may have been taught John's baptism, maybe even after Jesus had died, okay, and been raised. After, even after the church was established, maybe some people, I mean, they, obviously some people didn't know. And yet, it still wouldn't have counted. Why not? Because there's no understanding of what it was that they were doing. And it, and it speaks to that the act itself has no power without the full understanding of what one is doing. Now, this speaks to what do the Catholics believe? The, the infant baptism. They believe in inherited sin, or they call it original sin. And so as a result, they baptize infants because they believe infants have sin. And if, it, if an infant dies without having been baptized, when push comes to shove, they'll admit they don't think that baby's going to go to heaven. But... For someone to have, first of all, do, do babies have any sin? No. Okay. We know in every single example of people being saved from their sins, they repented. Okay. A child has no need to repent, first of all, much less capable of doing so, because there's no understanding there. That's why we talk about an age of accountability. When an individual comes to an age to fully be able to appreciate and understand their soul, salvation, eternity, hell, sin, righteousness, that sort of thing, then they come to that, that realization that they need to be saved, hopefully. But what we also have, in addition to that, is we have individuals who are often baptized, they're immersed in water in many other denominations. And they're often told Okay, that this is confirmation of your salvation, or this is an outward sign of an inward grace, uh, or something to that effect. But that they were saved the moment they accepted Jesus into their heart, or they were saved the moment they believed. So, if that's the case, and then someone is taught the truth, does their immersion count as being baptized into Christ Jesus? No. No. And I think Acts 19 provides a perfect example. Even though we're talking about John and Jesus, it still recognizes that one has to have an understanding. Because then they were baptized, verse 5, in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Okay, they understood that baptism was for remission of sins, that they didn't have remission of sins yet. They had been baptized unto, into, uh, for repentance unto remission of sins. And so they had to be baptized into Christ Jesus and into the full forgiveness of sins okay, and into the body of Christ. Well, a lot of individuals will make the argument or make the case that they don't believe they need to be immersed in water again because they've already been immersed in water. And a lot of times they will argue retroactively that it was for forgiveness of sins, even though whatever religion they grew up in or was, were baptized in, they don't teach that. Okay, very few, even, there are a handful of denominations that do teach baptism as for forgiveness of sins. In, incidentally, Catholic Catholicism is one, uh, which is why they, they baptize babies. But then you've got uh, true Southern Baptist. Uh, which are, are fairly rare nowadays, but they still believe in, in baptism for remission of sins. But by and large, in denominations, baptism isn't an essential required act to be saved. Okay, Maybe to confess your faith or to have a, a public show that you are now following Jesus, but not a, an essential requirement for the washing away of your sins. And even there are even some Christians who the, the statement has been made before that uh, there are Christians in denominations and it's our job to get them out. Uh, it would be extremely odd if that were the case because I can't be taught wrong but baptized right. If I'm not taught the truth about baptism... And what it does, it has me to the body of Christ, it washes away my sin, then how is that supposed to, in, in the end, it's a retroactive thing. People try to make it retroactive. But that's not what's happening here in Acts 19. And I think that's a very important application of what we find here regarding John's baptism, which also implies that everyone who had been baptized in John's baptism, who later became Christians, what did they have to do? be baptized into Christ. Okay, I think Acts 19 provides uh, a clear uh, precedent that even the apostles, remember we had some of the apostles as we looked at through our apostles, there were several of the apostles who were disciples of John and they likely were baptized by John. They would have had to have been baptized into Christ. Okay, the baptism of John didn't count for them to be for, for forgiveness of sins. Thoughts or comments through that? Yeah. They didn't miss something. But at the time John had come along, it was, what was the statement of it? Before Jesus' time. Before, before his day. coming, yep. So there was no baptism into Christ. Right. And that was so why would it count for, <laughs> for Jesus at that point? And again, I think what tends to happen is people put emphasis on the act of immersion, not on its, the, the understanding of its meaning. Okay, is the act important? Yes, the act is important because that's what is commanded for us to do. It, it's the obedience aspect of it. But obedience, you can't just go through the motions. I mean, that's no different than us uh, sitting in the pew singing a hymn and just singing the notes and not even paying attention to the words. Okay, yeah, you may be singing a praise to God, but does it mean anything to God? No, it's vain worship. You're going through the emotions. Okay? We have to have understanding in what we do. Paul even talks about, in 1 Corinthians, about the uh, singing with the understanding and, and speaking with, uh, in, in talking about revelation and so forth and, and prophecy, that he would rather be able to speak with understanding and, or have a gift that would enable uplifting and, and edifying rather than speaking in tongues where it may not be possible for people to understand what you're saying because nobody's there to interpret Okay, understanding is crucial in what we do. Uh, so, I mean, why would you go through an act and then try to retroactively make it, well, I did the deed, I, I actually was immersed, 
So that has to count. And, and I've, I've had people who, in the past, who've, who've asked me questions about their upbringing, that maybe they were raised in a Southern Baptist or a church that they're convinced taught baptism for remission of sins. And they ask me, what do you think? And my response has always been, I said, it takes five minutes. Okay, even if you're convinced that the church you were, grew, grew up in taught the truth on baptism, let's not risk it. Okay, they may have taught the truth on baptism, but there's a lot of other things they might not have taught the truth on. And I, I wouldn't want to risk my soul on that. I mean, it takes five minutes. We got towels, you know, and then you'll have peace of mind knowing you were baptized into Christ Jesus, regardless of if it was when you were 15 or now. And, and to me, it, it's, it's very little, um, uh, there's very little, uh, no downside to there's no downside. Yeah, there's no downside to doing that, to make sure that you're baptized into Christ Jesus. Any, thought, any other thoughts or comments on that? I, I didn't want to make a whole tangent on current day application, but I think it's very important to note that because of this example, dealing with John's baptism, there's serious precedent to understand how that application applies to us today. Because even though John's baptism isn't a thing today, certainly uh, immersion without meaning is. That's, that's, man, that's a great point. You know, when people say, you know, there's Christians in denominations and we got to get them out. Well, what were they baptized into then? And, and that goes to the second part of what baptism is about. It's not just forgiveness of sins. It adds me to the Lord's body. But if I'm being taught that baptism adds me to the Catholic church or adds me to the Baptist church, is that the Lord's body? No. And many churches today, especially community churches, they baptize people and make them members of their local body. Okay, you're not being baptized into the body of Christ, much less for forgiveness of sins. You're being baptized into this local body. And that's not something we, we read about in the New Testament. And so there's a whole host of things, uh, issues where people are taught something about baptism and they try, even in their own minds, sometimes they'll try to retroactively kind of retcon why they were baptized or what they were taught to make it okay. And in my mind, I'm like, why? Well, why, why not just do it for the right reason now that you know the truth? And, and I, I don't know if it has something to do with a desire to think, well, I, I want to have thought, I want to think of myself as having been saved <laughs> all this time when maybe in fact I haven't been. Maybe it's, well, my parents were baptized into this, so I, I want to be able to convince myself my parents are okay. I don't know. But in the end, again, it takes five minutes. Why not do it? You know what's right. You know the truth now. Whether you knew it then or not, you know it now. Just do it now. Yeah. That's like of man yeah there, there is a slight difference there is yes yeah that's true there's still similarities absolutely yeah yeah no you're absolutely right yeah the, the one constant here is it it has to be from heaven and if it's being taught if it's being modified by man in some form or fashion it's not from heaven yeah all right anything else through acts 19 all right, going to Mark chapter 1, we learn a little bit about how John was being portrayed or how he presented himself to uh, people. Uh, we see starting here in verse 1 or verse 2, uh, Mark quotes Old Testament describing the fact that the messenger was going to come. And of course, this is going to be John, verse 4. He, Mark doesn't waste any time. He directly goes to John as being the fulfillment of this prophecy. It says in verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And all in the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Uh, 
So, uh, first of all, obviously, John had a great deal of success in convincing the multitudes of their need for salvation. Okay, and that's what his purpose was, to prepare the way for the Lord. Well, the Lord's way is going to be much easier now, or you know, they're, they're prepared now to hear the fact that they need a Savior. And that's what John's whole purpose was, to convince people you need a Savior, the law doesn't save you. Well, verse 6, though, what's interesting is that he's kind of presented almost like a wild man in the wilderness. Okay, he's wearing, he's clothed with camel's hair. Presumably this is camel's hide. Okay, he's, he's wearing hides of camels. And he has a leather belt holding it all together. And he eats locusts and wild honey. Well, the wild honey I could get on board with, but locusts I'm not sure about. Uh, and these aren't just grasshoppers. These locusts are like, they're like that big. I mean, these things are huge. That's, that's not particularly appetizing to me. But that's what John did. Now, whether or not the Lord commanded him to do that, we're not told. Okay? There are several examples of prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, I mean, at one time, uh, I think it was Isaiah who was told by God to take his undergarments and put them on his head and prophesy about the, the defiling of Israel and so forth. And I mean, there was some really strange things that God commanded his prophets to do to show his people just how, how out there they had become. And it certainly got people's attention. And uh, I don't know if this is part of that or if this is just John being John. And yet people were still going out to him by the multitudes to hear him preach and to be baptized by him. Uh, but I think it's really interesting. And there's nothing about this. Sometimes people who may not know the Bible very well, they will mistakenly, again, associate verse 6 to having some, some kind of connection to the Nazarite vow. And, and this has nothing to do with anything of the Nazarite vow. Uh, leather belt, locust, wild honey. In fact, if these are hides of camels, uh, as uh, the commentary suggests, not just individual hair, it's hides. Uh, I'm not sure that that would actually go coincide with uh, the Nazarite vow, given they weren't supposed to touch any, any dead body. Whether hide, I don't know if hides count or not, but still, it, it has locust, wild honey, has nothing to do with the Nazarite vow. Uh, go ahead. When you look at what he, I mean, he's a rough looking character. Right? Yeah, yeah. Compared to what the, the individuals of that time that were preaching and teaching, your Sadducees, your Pharisees, the priests, whatever, they were completely different. I mean, you had one end of the spectrum and the other. Yeah. And maybe there was something about, you know, you don't have to go to the show stuff. Right. You know, and, and what's interesting about that is, and this goes back to the prophets of God, they often presented themselves, either by commandment or not, they were often presented as being on that spectrum of uh, this is the last person you would think that would have God's word, and yet here they are preaching God's word. You know, God often used the least of the houses of Israel, the, the least likely individuals God chose. And again, whether this is John just being John, okay, because he may, you know, that's just kind of the way he was. And he was a character, and maybe that helps you know, make him stand out a little bit to people. Uh, but regardless, this kind of goes back to what Jesus asked uh, the multitudes when he said, what did you go out to see? You know, did you go out to see a, a reed shaken by the wind? Did you go out to be entertained? Did you go out to see a show? Did you go out to see somebody who was dressed in fine apparel? What did you go out to see? And it's in that text that Jesus talks about John being the greatest uh, of those born among women. Uh, and uh, I think it's kind of interesting that, that there may be some connection to John's bearing or his presentation of himself with what Jesus said. You went out and saw a wild man who taught you God's word. Oh, really? They were clean. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know that. Okay. I wouldn't have thought about locusts, you know, being insects being clean, but I guess. Interesting. Okay. Anything else through uh, Mark 1 6?
Uh, of course, verse 7, verse 8, he goes on to describe the Lord. He says, there comes one after me who's mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loosen. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and of course, that has possibly some connection to what Paul said uh, regarding, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And of course, what John's referring to being baptized with the Holy Spirit can go either way with that as well, whether we're talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit or actually miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, either way, uh, th those are both uh, true. All right, in uh, Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7 and in verse 33, there were some individuals who were not readily acceptable, uh, accepting of John. Uh, we see in verse... Uh, starting in verse 29. So this is after Jesus talks about, you know, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? Uh, a prophet, yes, I say to you, more than a prophet. Uh, and then in verse 29, when all the people heard him, even tax collectors justified God having been baptized with the baptism of John. And so this kind of verified for them, this man truly was sent from God and we were taught by a prophet of God. And so that's why even the tax collectors justified God because they had been baptized of John. And the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. And you'll remember, some actually did go out to John, but John says, I'm not baptizing you, you brood of vipers, who, who warned you of, of the, the um, judgment to come and so forth. But in, and then in verse 31, the Lord said, To what then shall I liken the men of this generation, and what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, yet you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a clutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners." It's Jesus' way of showing the hypocrisy, particularly on the side of the uh, Pharisees and lawyers of verse 30. Apparently, some of them were saying he has a demon because he didn't eat bread or drink wine. Now, I remember back in Luke chapter 1, Gabriel told Zacharias that he would not, that uh, uh, John would not drink wine or strong drink. Okay, But apparently, he didn't come eating bread. He ate locusts and wild honey, and he didn't drink wine. <laughs> Very abnormal, okay, not like everybody else, and so he has a demon, the Pharisees and lawyers, or many of them said. And yet here's Jesus, he eats bread and he drinks the, the wine that they had to drink, and he says, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a sinner, a friend of tax collectors. Well, what do you want then, okay? What do you want? You have somebody who doesn't do any of that stuff, and he must have a demon because he doesn't do the stuff we do. Then you have someone like Jesus who, as he himself said, uh, a well person doesn't need a physician. It's the sick people who need a physician. So that's who he went to, tax collectors and so forth. Well, a glutton and a wine bibber and a, he associates with sinners. So I think that's interesting that uh, they made that claim based on John's, not just John's appearance, particularly Jesus brings out his diet, what he didn't eat, uh, that that meant that he had a demon because he's not like everybody else. Any thoughts through that? All right. Um, and we could go through uh, a lot of these specifics. Uh, Luke chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, uh, there's quite a bit of prophecy associated with John, and I'm not gonna, we're not going to go through all of it, uh, but Luke chapter 3, verse 4, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. It's interesting, this quote in Luke chapter 3 is actually a combination of a couple of quotes from the Old Testament, Isaiah and Malachi as well. Uh, so, in fact, there are many times in the New Testament where there's quotations of Old Testament. Sometimes it's not just from one place. Sometimes it's a combination of multiple places, which gives us commentary to show that these multiple places are all connected, which is kind of interesting. Um, was that the second bell? It was? Okay. All right, so we'll stop there. We'll pick up with uh, kind of his characteristics in his teaching uh, next Wednesday night, Lord willing. Thank you, everybody.